Amen. Amen. Thank you, praise team. I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Boys and girls, you may go to Children's Church at this time and also play practice. And uh, the rest of you should have received an outline in your bulletin. If you did not, if you will uh, raise your hand, one of our ushers will get you one of those here momentarily. So this morning we are continuing a ser- our series that we started last week uh, on uh, the big picture, talking about um, really how all of Scripture points to Christ. And uh, um, I think this is really just a great time to talk about this because here we are, we celebrating Advent, which... Uh, celebrates and talks about the coming of Christ and, 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 and directing our focus towards that. And so we want to see how all of Scripture kind of ties together and how all of it, um, how God has weaved this wonderful, miraculous story uh, all together to point to His Son given to redeem us from our sin. Amen? Amen. Uh, I am going to ask, I don't know if you can tell a little bit, i got some allergies or something going on, so if I sound like a frog in a bucket this morning um, with the lid on top, um, it's actually gotten a little better from this morning. I, was, I woke up this morning, every foot woke up, you know, and I, I haven't been sick or anything like that. It's just, well, it sounded, it sounded like, you know, I could sing like the lowest of the low bass this morning. It was just really, it's gotten a little better this morning, so um, hopefully that will, that will continue to improve. You know, when I was a kid... Uh, I wanted to be an architect. I, um, I don't know, I've always been fascinated by uh, buildings and building things. Um, probably explains why I love Lego so much. Um, uh, any Lego fans in here? Okay, yeah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, that's probably why uh, my boys love Legos and love building things with that. Uh, one of the things that interested me um, about architecture was, was m- models. You know, models of architecture or models of buildings and things. Um, you know, I, uh, even as a kid, I'd build Legos uh, into big, build, big buildings and stuff. Um, you know, I know nowadays Legos are Star Wars or, you know, little people and stuff. But, you know, back when we were kids, you know, you had the green mat and then just a, a box full of Legos, right? And you just built what you could come up with out of your own mind. And so, the, oh, oh, for the good days, right? But it didn't just stop with Legos. I would build with popsicle sticks, uh, build little buildings and so forth and things. I don't know if any of you guys uh, ever did that uh, growing up and so forth. So building just kind of fascinated me, model cars, all those things. So when uh, several years ago, when Laura invited me or asked me if I wanted to go see um, the Bird's Eye Museum, in Wakarusa, I was all, all for it. Anybody here heard of the Bird's Eye Museum in Wakarusa? Okay, one, that's it? All right, well, we're going to, I don't even know if exactly where the Bird's Eye Museum is anymore, okay? So I'm going to show you some pictures here of it, but uh, uh, just leave it on that one right there for just a minute. The Bird's Eye Museum in Wakarusa was started by, uh, with a, by a man named Devon Rose, Back in 1961, um, with simply when he bought his kids a, a model train set. So he bought them a model train set, and he began to build um, little buildings out of toothpicks, matchbox, whatever. And uh, he began to build buildings around the, the railroad track. I don't know exactly, I uh, don't remember exactly how all the, um, the reasons for got him into it and so forth. But he began to build out a model of the city or town of Wakarusa. And so uh, in his basement, uh, as part of it here, show the next slide there if you don't mind. Uh, In his basement, he has built out a virtual model of the town of of Wakarusa. And uh, I think he's even gone out from there. He went and built um, things all through Elkhart County, um, even some buildings, historical buildings throughout Indiana and so forth. 
uh, read an article that here just a few years ago, um, maybe eight years ago or so, um, because I don't even know if he's still alive or not, but he uh, donated that to the Historical Society of Wakarusa. Um, Quite an interesting thing um, as he just kind of built out the whole town. It was really quite interesting. Now, uh, I find these kind of things fascinating and so forth. Uh, But one of the reasons being is not so much making models of something that already is, but I love to see models and things of something that is yet to be built. You know, that's kind of what architects do. They build models. Um, I I don't know how much they do this anymore. Uh, The next slide, you know, here they build 3D physical models, you know, that that can look pretty fancy. Um, nowadays, uh, maybe some of you have worked with this, they, they go in not building a physical model, but they do a CAD model on a computer-assisted um, drawing or design uh, model. Uh, even, you know, there are other models uh, that architects do, like when we built our children's building, um, they do drawings, right? So the question I want to ask this morning is, why do architects do all of that? Why do they build models? Why do they, why do, they do drawings uh, and things like that? Well, the reality is that the reason, the purpose for that is to help people see and visualize a project. It is is to help them know what is coming, help them know what the actual building or statue is or monument or whatever it is they're going to be building will look like and to hopefully prepare people for that to get them excited about it. Here's the reason I tell you that this morning, friends. In a very similar way to architectural models, God gives us in the Old Testament uh, various patterns and symbols, uh, models, if you will, of things that are in Old Testament times yet to come. Uh, Things that will help us and originally the Jews to understand um, what would be coming in the New Testament. God's design, God's plan, who Jesus would be, who the Messiah would be. God gives us models in the Old Testament uh, for the Jews and then for us to look back on to prepare for the coming Messiah. I want to share with you something that within the scope of biblical theology, there's a name given to this. It's called typology. You may have heard that name before or heard that term. Okay, It's called typology or the study of types. Now, the word type here is used in a little bit different sense um, than we think of. We think of, um, you know, this is a type of wood. You know, this is a type of, of fabric on our chairs here. It's a little bit different. The word type here in this sense is um, used in the sense of a symbol. Uh, typology is a special kind of Old Testament symbolism that is prophetic in nature. Uh, A type can be any person, place, event, or thing uh, in the Old Testament that foreshadows or represents something in the New Testament. Um, The symbol or the type in the Old Testament provides the concept, very much like an architectural model, provides the concept for understanding God's purposes in the New Testament. So, in, in understanding this in the scope of all of Scripture, some people don't see a connection between, as we talked about last week, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so what I want to show you throughout this whole series that we're doing is, friends, listen, what God did in the New Testament wasn't that all of a sudden he was bipolar and he changed his thinking. Okay? Uh, everything was God's plan from the beginning. It wasn't plan B. God had it all. And, 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 and to prove that, to show that, to demonstrate that, friends, we see various types that he has well, woven into history, given us, recorded in the Old Testament, that foreshadows things in the New Testament. Um, interestingly, and, uh, interestingly enough, that symbol in the Old Testament that provides the concept for understanding God's purposes in the New Testament is called the type. Anybody want to guess what, the, what the, the thing that it points to is called? Anybody know? It's the antitype. Okay? So let's take what we talked about last week. If you are here last week, we talked about various possible Christophanies, some Theophanies in the Old Testament. And um, there's, a, there's a sense in which everything that we're going to talk about in this series could be labeled as a type or a symbol. So last week we talked about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a type, a symbol for who? 
for Christ. For Christ. So if Melchizedek is the type, what's the anti-type? Or who's the anti-type? Christ. The Lord Jesus. And so um, even though, I, as I said last week, I believe Melchizedek was way more than just a symbol, friends. He was a foreshadowing of Christ to come. Um, now, technically, a type is only a type if the New Testament identifies it as such. You know, let's, I want to just say this. We need to be careful. Um, we cannot um, allegorize things in the Old Testament to the point that we are just pulling out things that we think they are. There are The things we're going to talk about this morning are obvious. And the New Testament shows us the symbolism that the Old Testament, uh, that God had intended in the Old Testament. So um, today we're going to talk about three specific patterns, symbols, types in the Old Testament that point to Jesus Christ. Number one. Actually, I'm not going to give you number one yet. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 8. Give it, give it to you here in just a moment. Hebrews chapter 8. Now, if you remember, we, uh, we did a series on the book of Hebrews here a couple years ago. And uh, we talked about these things. But I want to just point out and pull out some, um, some things that the, 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 the letter to the Hebrews um, says to us and points out about this to us. Verse 1 of chapter 8 says this. It says, now this is the main point of the things that we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Who is that? It's Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, he says, a minister of the sanctuary and of the, what? True tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. Look at verse 5. Who serve what? The copy and shadow of the heavenly things. So scripture describes these types, these symbols as copies or shadows. So it is as if uh, the real thing is here and uh, the, the visual is that there's a shadow that is projecting. You can see the shadow, not yet the real thing. So the Old Testament types are also sometimes called shadows. Who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the what? The pattern shown you on the mountain. So how many of you have ever been reading through, tried to read? Listen, I, I, you say, you know what? This year I am determined I'm going to read through my Bible this year. And you get to the end of Exodus and Leviticus and you are just struggling. Ever been there? Okay. Um, and you're saying, man, how do I get through all this? And there's, there's the laws and the, the, the way the tabernacle is to be built and all these things that you don't understand and so forth and so on. And, and, and here's, what, here's why all that stuff's there. You see, God gave all those instructions to Moses and the Israelites as a pattern for them to build the tabernacle. But uh, that, it, 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 that's not, that wasn't the end-all, be-all. Okay, look at chapter 9, verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 1 says this, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared. So here in the Old Testament, way back in the Old Testament, God gave specific instructions to Moses on how they were to build the tabernacle. Now, when was the tabernacle built? It was built when the Israelites were where? In the wilderness. Okay? And so it wasn't like they were going to build a permanent structure but God gave them specific instructions down to the minutest detail on how they were to build this. But it wasn't built in the sense that we build a building. It was, it was basically a tent. The word tabernacle means tent. It was a tent of meeting. It was a place. It was to be their place of worship. Now here's, a, here's a model of uh, the tabernacle. And here's kind of the deal with the tabernacle. So it was a tent. It was portable. All right? So imagine... Uh, you know, I know some of you maybe have been a part of a church before. That's a church plant that you have to set up and tear down every Sunday. But imagine you just didn't have to set up and tear down the chairs, but you had to set up and tear down the whole thing. Okay, that's basically what they had to do. 
probably not every week and so forth, but they would move to a location, and when they were in that location, um, they, everybody had a job, and they set up the tabernacle. And here is the tabernacle complex and so forth. Technically, the tabernacle proper is the center part. Um, I think I have a laser pointer here. Um, the center part right here, um, which was broken down into two parts. Let's continue on in verse 2. It says, For a tabernacle was prepared. The first part, if you'll... Um, Go ahead and show me the next slide there, please. Shows an, this shows a kind of a, a floor plan or a, a view looking from the top. It says, for the first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary or the holy place. So the first section of that um, tabernacle uh, is called the holy place. It says, and behind the second veil, and here being the veil, and here this second part says here, The part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, if you've heard that term before. It goes on to describe, which had the golden censer uh, and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold. And verse 5 says, above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So here you have the tabernacle, and, and without getting into too much detail here, it is set up with the holy place and the most holy place, the holy of holies. This is where God's presence would come uh, to dwell with them um, because of God's holiness it was uh, they were separated uh, here is the veil that separates the most holy place from the holy place look at verse 6 it says now when these things had been thus prepared the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services so the priests on a regular basis would go into the first part, making sure the showbread was there, making sure the lampstand uh, had oil and all those things, and they would take care of all of that. But look at verse 7. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and then for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So uh, the second part, only the high priest could go in. Only once a year on the Day of Atonement. Could he go in and he uh, him going in there was um, he had to first offer a sacrifice for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. And then he would go in and sprinkle uh, the blood from uh, the, the animal on the mercy seat um, a, 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 to appease or a symbol of appeasing the, the wrath of God against the sins of the people. But look at verse eight. It says the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all. Now, it's not talking here about, um, about the holy of holies. It's talking about the very presence of God. It says that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Verse 9, it being the first tabernacle was what? Symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, You're concerned with only foods, drinks, all that kind of stuff. It says, imposed until the time of reformation in verse 10. But look at verse 11. It says, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place, that holy of holies, but not the physical holy of holies. Where? Into the throne room of God Almighty. And entered into the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Friends, so what we see is that the tabernacle, the Old Testament physical tabernacle is a symbol Friends, teaching us that the only way we can hope to enter into the real holy of holies is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's not all. Look look over at chapter 10, verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, we're a chapter or so later, and we're going to come back to some of that stuff in the middle there. But because of the sacrifice that Christ gave for us, we know that there's no way we can uh, earn God's favor. There's nothing we can do to make up for the sin that we've done. Um, There's not even uh, physical sacrifices don't actually make up. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Um, 
don't actually pay for our sin. Only the blood of Christ because he became one of us so that he could die for us. Therefore, therefore, allowing us to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Now I've already mentioned this, but the, if you can go back one slide there to the picture of the tabernacle. In between the... Gabe, if you can go back there for just, can you go backwards? Maybe we can't go backwards. There we go. Uh, from the holy place, uh, separating the holy place and the holy of holies was the veil. Later on, when the temple was built and, and then rebuilt, um, uh, the, the, the layout of the temple uh, was very similar to the tabernacle. It was once they could build the permanent structure uh, in Jerusalem. Um, there was uh, a veil, same, called the same thing here, but it was basically a huge heavy curtain, all right? This is not like your bathroom curtain, okay? Um, but a huge heavy curtain that separated the holy of holies from the most holy place. And we know, uh, the scripture tells us, that when Christ was sacrificed on the cross, what happened to the veil that was the separate? See, the, the veil uh, symbolized originally our sin, that separates us from the holiness of God, that keeps us from being able to have fellowship with God. But when Christ died on the cross, what happened? It broke. It tore, right, from top to bottom. Wow. Symbolizing what? Symbolizing the, the coming into freedom, amen? Coming into freedom that we have. Symbolizing that we now have access to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 21 and 22. It says, Having a high priest over the house of God, let us now draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So through faith in Christ, the veil has been torn down through his blood, and we now are able to be reconciled to God, to have direct access so that we can come, as verse 19 says, with boldness into the, directly to God. But look at verse 22. Look at the symbolism here at the end. It says, Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Uh, the symbolism is still brought on there from the tabernacle. The priest had to go in and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. The, the symbolism is there, friends. Our hearts are, are, listen, there's nothing we can do to make our hearts right before God. Uh, it's what Christ did, his sacrifice on the cross that allows us to be saved, amen, and be reconciled to God. Friends, so what we see is that not only is the greater tabernacle a symbol of uh, New Testament truths, but also the veil is a symbol of the very flesh and body of Christ, which is broken for us on the cross to allow us to have access to God. Friends, here's why I see this. It's so amazing. Here's what it shows. It shows, friends, that God. this was God's plan all along. Uh, sin didn't surprise him. It didn't throw God off. Oh my goodness, Adam and Eve sinned. What am I going to do? He knew from the moment he created, he knew what was going to happen. He knew what he would have to do. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, he knew what he would have to do. And he was willing to do it. Friends, from the foundation of the world, this was all part of his plan. But it doesn't stop there. Let's, let's look at number two. Just as the tabernacle was part of God's plan, was a symbol, a type of New Testament truths. Friends, um, the second thing we see, that a pattern or a symbol from the Old Testament, is the sacrificial system as a whole. The sacrificial system did the same thing. Look back at chapter 9 there in Hebrews, verse 13. Chapter 9, verse 13. It says, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ? I, I believe here what it's saying. He's not saying that the blood of bulls and goats actually sanctifies. He says, listen, if you think that sanctifies, how much more the blood of Christ? Amen. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot. He is the spotless Lamb of God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Look down at verse 23. Now, uh, we, we skipped over just a little bit, but uh, uh, Moses, when God gave him the 
the Ten Commandments and the law and gave him all the things for the tabernacle and stuff. The verses right before 19 to 22 talk about how Moses sprinkled that with, uh, with, with, with blood of a sacrifice to purify that. Uh, verse 22 is important. Uh, it says that according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness. Verse 23 says this, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. So uh, what is he calling the copies? He's talking about the tabernacle, the law, all of those things. They're just copies. They're just types. They're just symbols. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He said, listen, Jesus, we don't need somebody to go into there every, uh, every year as the high priest did on the Day of Atonement. He said he, would then, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Friends, so it is by what Christ did on the cross... Not, it was never by the sacrifices of bulls and goats and all of those things, friends. It's by Christ's sacrifice that our sins have been atoned for. Amen? That the penalty has been paid. Uh, and you may, you may say, but pastor, then what, what about all those sacrifices? What was the purpose of those sacrifices? We'll look at chapter 10. Verse 1. It says, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come. Now here... The, the term law, um, many times it just refers to the law as the Ten Commandments or the law of Moses here. But I believe what it's referring to here is really just everything given in the law, okay, uh, including, in which in technically the, the tabernacle, the instructions to the tabernacle, all of that was given in, uh, in the, the Torah and in, in the law of Moses as God delivered that to Moses as well. But it says, for the law, having a what? Shadow of the good things to come. And not the very image of the things can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect or righteous before God. So Old Testament sacrifices, were they ever intended to actually save anybody? No. What were they intended for? It's to point to Christ. It's to point to Christ. It was to give them a vision. It was to give them a model of what the Messiah would do. And so that I believe the way that that anybody was saved in the Old Testament is the same way uh, that we're saved now. They looked forward to the cross where we look back to the cross. Look at verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. So reminder of sins, reminder of sins. For it is not possible, verse 4 says, that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Look down at verse 11. It says, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, what's he talking about? The Lord Jesus Christ. This man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering, how many? One offering. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Um, what was the purpose of all those sacrifices? Was to point to point to Jesus. It was to point to Christ. I love verse 14 there. Um, I'm going to talk about a verse that um, says that we're not the ones who save us, but it's God who saves us. And that once we're saved, we're always saved. It's verse 14. Look at what it says. It says, for by one offering, that offering was his sacrifice on the cross, 
He has perfected. Past tense with continuing action. So he, it has already been accomplished. When you, when, when you are saved, when you put your faith in Christ, he has already perfected forever those who are being sanctified or those who are being set apart. In other words, if we've been saved, and we've been set apart unto the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is doing his work in us as we are his, then we are already perfected, and that perfection is forever. Amen? Amen. Christ's righteousness is given to us. His perfection. You say, Pastor, how can I be perfect? How can I stand before God in a worthy manner? Friends, it's not of our own worth, but it is of Christ's worth, which has been given to us. Amen? It was all to point to him. Animal sacrifices was to teach the seriousness of sin. It was to teach the necessity of a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin, friends. But Jesus' sacrifice did what those animal sacrifices could never do. And they were never intended to do, friends. Satisfy the wrath of God against sin. He had to be one of us. That's why, as we celebrate here in just about a month, Jesus Becoming a baby, becoming a human being. He had to live a sinless life and be spotless to offer himself in our place. Because of that, friends, the Father says that he accepts his sacrifice on behalf of us, in behalf of our sin, so that we put our faith and trust in him. We believe that with all of our hearts, friends. We are saved. Amen? The tabernacle... The veil, symbolism that points to Christ. The sacrificial, sim- the sacrificial system, friends, it's a type, it's a symbol, it's a pattern that points to Christ. And the last one we're going to look at this morning is such a beautiful picture. It's a picture of the Passover lamb. Now, if you have been saved for any length of time, you have undoubtedly heard and sung about Uh, the Lord Jesus as the the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Amen? Read that, sung about that before? You may say, but Pastor, Pastor, where does that imagery come about? Maybe you've sung about that. You've heard of Jesus being described as the lamb of God. But you say, I'm not sure I've really ever understood that, Pastor, uh, why we call him that. Where does it come from? Well, first of all, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. They are going to be on the screen and in your outline as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. In the midst of Paul talking about immorality in the church of Corinth and talking about um, how they need to purge out the old leaven, he makes a reference um, to uh, the Passover. And uh, uh, it has a lot to do with the feast and and the, 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 the feast of unleavened bread. But in verse 7, he makes this statement. He says, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Friends, here Paul calls Jesus, very literally, our Pascha. Uh, That term could be used for the Passover in a lot of different senses, friends. But here, what Paul is referring is he's calling Jesus our Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us. Look at John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29 is when Jesus was going out to be baptized by John the Baptist. John saw Jesus coming towards him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Friends, again, a clear reference where John the Baptist is calling Jesus the Lamb of God. He's referring to him as the Passover Lamb. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Peter writes this, he says, Knowing... That you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but 
with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Friends, what a beautiful picture. Amen? What a beautiful picture that, that is clearly uh, referred to not only here, other places in Scripture and Revelation, uh, we know that all will worship the Lamb. Friends, all these Scriptures make a clear and definite connection uh, of Jesus Christ to the Passover Lamb. But the question is, what does that mean? You say, Pastor, what, what was the Passover Lamb? Why, why, are, why are they referring to Jesus as the Passover Lamb? Well, the Passover feast was celebrated Um, still celebrated by many Israelites, celebrating their God's deliverance of them from Egypt. God had shown his power to Pharaoh in a lot of mighty ways. If you remember, God had called Moses to go back to lead lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And so Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people out of here. And Pharaoh said, I don't think so. And so God began to reveal himself to Pharaoh through his power, if you will, through a series of plagues. Um, Multiple times throughout the plagues that Moses came and um, were poured out on Egypt. Multiple times Pharaoh came close to uh, allowing the Israelites to to go and to leave. And then he would change his mind. His heart would be hardened and, and, and he would not until finally... Um, it, it comes to the 10th, and, and by that time, Pharaoh was mad, and, and Moses was mad, and guess what? God was mad. And so God um, get, tells Moses to, 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 that he's going to pour out one more plague on Egypt. And it's the plague of where the, the, the firstborn of every family, every animal in Egypt is going to, is going to be killed, is going to die. And he pours this out, tells Pharaoh, listen, unless you let our people go, this is what's going to happen. Of course, Pharaoh doesn't. He's hardened his heart by that point. Uh, But every family, everyone's going to lose their firstborn. So God also shares with Moses to tell the Israelites um, how to keep their firstborns from, from being killed. And he says, here's what you are to do. You are to take a lamb and you are to sacrifice that lamb and you are to take uh, the, the blood from the lamb that you sacrificed, and you're to take that blood and you are to sprinkle that blood on the doorpost, on the side, uh, the door jams, if you will, as we might call it today, on the side of the doors and on the lintel, so that when the death angel passes that way, comes through that night, he will see the blood that is a covering for your sin, and he will do what? Pass over your home, and your household will be saved. And so it is for that reason that the Jews celebrate Passover. That is the meaning behind the Passover lamb. Now, I don't think it takes a genius to see the correlation there. Amen? Um, It should be obvious to us the correlation uh, between the Passover lamb and Jesus himself. Friends, Um, Jesus is the true Passover lamb. In fact, friends, he was crucified during Passover, during the Passover celebration. The Passover lamb was a symbol, was a type, was a, was a, a pattern, if you will, to point to Jesus. Yesterday, um, we got the opportunity, um, Laura and I and, and John and Nancy to go down to Purdue um, to see Hannah, our oldest child, um, perform in a uh, Christmas program, perform with the Purdue Choir in their Christmas program. Um, I know we have some of you in here are Purdue grads. Um, it, I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but it, it is outstanding. Um, we, last year, and I think I mentioned something even last year and so forth, but it is outstanding. They do four shows between yesterday and today. Um, I think they've sold over 18,000 tickets. Um, it is a huge production, um, but it is magnificent. If you ever get a chance to go, they just do a really great job. Um, and, and, and they don't even have music as a major at Purdue. Get that. that it, it's pretty. Um, but here's what surprised me. As we sat there for a couple of hours, 
uh, that passed by really quickly as we watched and listened to the music that was sung. What surprised me, friends, were how many of the songs that they sang which spoke openly about Jesus as the Christ, as our Savior. I was surprised. Here we have a secular university that is singing uh, Christmas songs about Jesus the Christ. I got to thinking about that. And I was thinking, you know, um, that is surprising. But you have to work awful hard to do a Christmas program and leave Jesus totally out. Amen? I mean, you really have to try hard. To do a Christmas program. Now listen, I know they're, they're, they do it. Many people do it, friends. But here, it's hard to leave Jesus out. Why? Because Christmas points to Jesus. It points to Jesus. He's the reason for the season. He's what it's all about. Well, friends, the same thing is true about the Scriptures. As this morning, we've looked at the tabernacle, the veil, the sacrificial system, the Passover lamb, friends. Guess what? It's not all about those symbols. It's all about Jesus. It all points to him. Friends, it's hard to to look in Scripture and not see Jesus. A few years ago, there was a, um, a huge Vietnam veterans parade held in the city of Chicago. What made this particular parade unique was that part of the commemoration involved a, uh, a mobile version, a somewhat smaller version of the original Vietnam Memorial Wall. Uh, like the original wall back in Washington, D.C., um, this mobile version, this mobile replica, uh, bore the names of all the soldiers who had died in Vietnam written on it. A newscaster covering the parade Uh, found one particular veteran and asked him why he had come all the way to Chicago to visit this memorial and to participate in the parade. The soldier looked straight into the face of the reporter with tears flowing down his face, said this. He said, pointing at the wall, he said, because of this man right here. So the soldier talked. He was pointing to the name of a friend that he had served with that was etched in the wall. He said, this man, he traced it with his fingers. As he traced it with his fingers, the letters of his friend's name in the wall, he continued by saying, this man right here gave his life for me. He gave his life. He didn't elaborate. He didn't go into a lot more details, friends. But as the news clip ended, the sobbing soldier let the tears flow as he stood there continually just tracing over feeling over the name of his friend over and over again with his finger. Why? Why would he do that? Why would he be so emotionally drawn, friends? I believe it was because of the gratefulness for what his friend had done for him. Friends, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to get our minds around the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. I think it does us good to retrace the old story over and over and over again. To look at all the wonderful ways that God has given us throughout his word. To picture it even before it ever happened. To look forward to it. To look back on it. To celebrate it. To to. Let it always be in the forefront of our minds, friends, to trace the old, old story once again. I don't know where you are with all of this. Um, I don't know. Has there been a time in your life when you have surrendered your life to Christ? You know, everything that, that, po- that all these things point to, the, the, the sacrifice of, of, of Jesus Christ on the cross, the, what we're going to celebrate here in a month, that God, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, stepped out of heaven to come to earth. Friends, the reason all that happened was for you. Was so that he could come, give his life as payment for yours. Does that affect you at all? 
we go through our everyday lives and we just do whatever we are just doing and we sometimes I wonder if we really understand where we would be without what Christ has done for us. I want to challenge you this morning. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus as the Savior of your life, friends, I encourage you, plead with you, beg with you, would you do that this morning? If you have, would you just thank Him for it? Would you allow your life to be an overflow of praise and thanksgiving? You know, we come here on Sunday morning and we sing. When Jesus gave His life for us, we come and and we sing, oh, thank you, Lord. And we just, it, 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 it's as if it doesn't mean anything to us. We go out and we live our lives and, and, and we don't live as if we have been redeemed and saved from the pit of hell. Friends, we truly understand what Christ has done for us. It will transform the way we live, the way we share him with others, the way we allow him to flow, his love to flow through us. Amen. I want you to consider this morning where you are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your great plan. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to step out of heaven, that you were willing to come to earth, to give of yourself as a sacrifice for our sins. Lord, please help us to understand the magnitude of that, of what you have done for us. And Lord, transform us through the power of your cross. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you, if you will, if you just stand with me. We're going to sing a, a song of, of invitation of decision. If you're here this morning and, man, maybe you've just invited Christ into your life for the very first time. We'd love to celebrate that with you. Maybe you have some things you'd like for us to pray with you about. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Friends, whatever it is, I want to encourage you to respond to, respond to the Lord. Respond to how he's speaking to you this morning. Maybe you just want to come and do business with God. Whatever's going on in your life, you need to confess some things, get some things right with him. I want to invite you to do that this morning as we sing.